All right, well, I'm going to move as rapidly as I can without panting. <laughs> Decently and orderly, but nevertheless, uh, quickly. When we talk about the Persians, of course, we need to think about who preceded them, and usually you think of the Medes and the Persians. They were cousins, they weren't the very same group, but they were related. They all came down as a part of Indo-European migration around the year 1000 to 900 BC. Others had come in earlier. They became the group that we call the Hittites. They also wound up over in Troy and were part of the Trojan War. They were also in Greece, and so the Greeks and the Trojans were fighting cousins of each other. They were all Indo-Europeans. Well, others of these migrated down into this region that is off more or less to the east. These are not, therefore, Arabs. Persians are not Arabs. They're two quite different ethnicities historically, and the Medes and the Persians who come down into what is present-day Iran are people who came in this great migration about then. They settled in a mountain range called the Zagros, very rocky terrain, kind of rough. It developed in them a sort of rough and rocky kind of personality, I suppose. That's why Amites, the daughter of Syaxares, the king of the Medes, was homesick when she wound up in Babylon where there were no mountains. And that's why Nebuchadnezzar built, built for her the Hanging Gardens that we mentioned a couple of weeks ago. The first reference we have to these people in history comes from the Assyrians. The Persians and Medes didn't leave any records until much later. But the Assyrians make mention of them dating back to about the year 850 and mention them as troublesome people, not a threat, but just people who were out there kind of rabble-rousing and causing a little bit of upset in the Assyrian world. Their history at this juncture is fairly obscure. The best information comes from Herodotus, who's basing it on sources that he had available to him. We're not quite clear what all those sources were. But according to Herodotus, there's a series of Median kings. We move from relatively obscure to less obscure, eras in Median history as we go along, but the first of these was a guy named Dioces. He seems to have distinguished himself by uniting a bunch of tribal groups that were more or less in a semi-hostile relationship to each other under his rule, and he establishes it at a little city called Ecbatana, which continues to exist to this day. The first Assyrian who really seems to make any sort of concerted attack on the Medians is Ezer Hayden, the, the Assyrian. We talked about him two or three weeks ago. He sent frequent raiding parties into this region, more or less interested in their war horses. Median war horses were famous. They were like a, a, a battle weapon, you know. And so he was trying to get those and trying to keep them in some degree of uh, under control. So he launches some attacks against Media. This attack from outside caused the Medians to unite together and name one person as their leader, and that seems to be this first guy, Dioces. His son, Freortes, rules from 675 to 653. He's the son of Dioces. He is the ruler at the time that Ashurbanipal is in Assyria. We've talked about Ashurbanipal before, who continues to raid and attack. And finally, the... Medians became so tired of it that they struck back. And in 653, some of you who've been in the class know, we talked about Ashurbanipal's very bad year. Remember that? This is the year. Freortes launched an attack back in 653, and as it turns out, Ashurbanipal had multiple problems on multiple fronts in the same year. So not only did the Medians attack, but the Egyptians revolted, the Syrians, the Phoenicians, the Babylonians. His entire empire was sort of up for grabs for a while. This is the year that Manasseh, the Jewish king, revolted and was taken off eventually as a prisoner to uh, Assyria. So anyway, what happened is that uh, uh, Asher, uh, Freortes attacked. He was, he was killed himself in the attack, and that left his son Syaxares, who we've mentioned now before, ruling, but he's only about 19 years old at this time, and he's overwhelmed early on in his rule by an invasion of Scythians. Orcs, remember that? Scythians equals orcs. And they came down, and they just made life miserable for a lot of regions, including Media and some parts of Assyria, and actually elsewhere in the ancient Near East. And this is called the Scythium Interregnum. 
in which median history is sort of broken up by the presence of these very barbarian, uncivilized, but violent characters that more or less keep everybody off balance. But as it turns out, Cyaxares, in the year 625, about 20 years later, 25 years later, is able by a sort of ruse to drive out the Scythians. You may recall 625 is also the year Nabopolassar gained control of Babylon and the year, or at least that time frame, in which Syracus, uh, rather, the last king of the Assyrians, the cross-dresser, was... <laughs> whatever it takes, you know, <laughs> was involved in civil conflicts in Assyria and also in an ongoing battle with Nabopolassar. So all of this is, should be a little bit of review. If you've been in the class, this should all be ringing bells. We're just looking at it from the median point of view now. So Syaxares is able to recover the throne in 625, and he spends about the next 10 years rebuilding median military power. The Assyrians are not there to bother him because they're all tied up knots in their own internal conflicts. And so he can develop a pretty potent fighting force over the next 10 years or so. And Assyria, of course, is becoming increasingly weak. And Media and Babylon both are becoming increasingly more powerful over this 10-year period. So that culminates in 615 when Syaxares believes he has sufficient horsepower to launch an attack into Assyria. And he does so. The first city he attacks is right on the perimeter there. It's called Ara Arapaka, and it falls easily. From there, he travels further in, and in 614, he and Nabopolassar actually meet each other in a united joint siege of Asher. And that's when Syaxares and Nabopolassar shake hands, have a couple of beers, and say, hey, how's about my daughter marry your son? And then it works out that way. And so as a result of that, Nabopolassar's son, Nebuchadnezzar, marries Amites, the daughter of Syaxares. And you have this then treaty between the Medians on the one hand and the Babylonians on the other. The uh, following couple of years go by, and then we have the final uh, fall of Assyria in 612, again at the hands of the Medes and the Babylonians. So this is, again, review, and it should be somewhat uh, familiar if you've been in the class here for a while. From that point on, you know that the Babylonians and the Medes divide up the Assyrian holdings kind of like a pie. They divide it in half, and they say, okay, the Medians can have the north half, and the Babylonians will have the southern half. And so we've looked at the Babylonian history and their interactions in Jerusalem and so on. What happens in the north with the Medians is they essentially launch a campaign across present-day Turkey, what's called Anatolia, and they're pretty successful. These are, these are the kind of leftovers of the Hittites. They're not very powerful at this point. And they're able more or less to gobble up land without much dis, uh, difficulty until they reach the very western region called Asia Minor, and back in those days, it was called Phrygia and Lydia. So those were the two. And at that point, they get caught in some pretty powerful struggles with local um, you know, military forces and so on. It continues for about five years, this battle between the Medians and the uh, Phrygians and Lydians. And nobody's making much progress, but there's a lot of bloodshed. A battle takes place in 585 called the Battle of the Eclipse. Now, if you've ever studied ancient philosophy, you've heard the name Thales, who's sometimes credited as being the first Greek philosopher. He's a pre-Socratic philosopher. He believed everything was made of water and so on. You may know something about him. But one of the things that really catapulted him into the public eye was he successfully predicted an eclipse of the sun on May 28, 585 BC. He could do that because he was a smart guy. And he studied the heavens and was able to figure out that the eclipse would happen. But what he said was the gods are angry. Now, Thales himself was an atheist. But he was tired of the war going on. And so he gets up and publicly says the gods are angry with all you people fighting each other. And as a shot across the bow, the gods are going to darken the sun. On May 28th, 585 B.C. He didn't know it was 585 B.C., you understand that. <laughs> but he named the date and said that's what would happen. Nobody took any, no one paid attention until, in fact, the eclipse happened and the sun was darkened and everybody was terrified. They laid down their arms, they prostrated themselves, they went home. 
And so it was the end of it. It's called the Battle of the Eclipse, a very famous uh, incident there in the ancient world. It happens in 585. It just so happens that Cyaxares dies that same year, not from the battle, but just, I think, from old age. And that brings his son, then, Astyages, not nearly of the prowess and competence of his father, universally disliked, but he happens to inherit the throne. And so Astyages rules the Medians. He believes the Persians are a bunch of backwater sort of uh, Neanderthals. You know, he doesn't have much respect for them. He has, according to Herodotus, a dream that his daughter is going to give birth to a son who is going to rule the world. And Astyages thinks to himself, I don't want that kid around here. So he takes his daughter, Mondane, and has her marry a, a sort of obscure prince of the Persians, figuring he'll get her out there with the Persians where no good things can happen, and that'll sort of decommission her so this prophecy can never occur, this dream that he had. So he marries her off to a, Med or to a, a Persian prince named Cambyses, and the two of them have a son whose name is Cyrus, you know. And so uh, Cyrus uh, is born in 583 B.C. Twenty years later, he has already distinguished himself as a remarkable young man. He's become a prince of a region called Anshan, which is down in the southern part of Persia around the city of Susa there, it'd be in present-day Iran. And so he's ruling then a local kind of provincial area under the control of Astyages, his grandfather, who is the Median king. So this brings Cyrus then on the scene. All right, 556, Nabonidus, you recall, is the last Babylonian king, seizes the throne in a coup of Babylon because he wanted to recover Haran, that city up there, which had been the venue of a temple to the goddess Sin, and his mother, Nabonidus' mother, was a, prince, a, a priestess of that particular form of worship. So he wants to get back Quran, which was presently held by the Medians. He's Babylonian, he wants Quran. He cooks up a deal with Cyrus. He says, hey, Cyrus, young, talented Persian prince, I will help you defeat Astyages if in return you will give me the city of Quran. Cyrus says, sounds like a good deal to me. So they form a coalition, and as it turns out in the year 551, Cyrus defeats Astyages. It's a real easy defeat. Not a shot is fired because everybody hated Astyages and his entire army defected to Cyrus on the spot. And so it was uh, kind of a quick and easy victory. And at that point, 551 BC, Cyrus becomes king of the Medes and the Persians and the Medo-Persian Empire is established at that point. So he has about a 20 year rule. He rules from 551 to 530. He's mentioned, as we uh, indicated before, prominently in the Old Testament. He's given fairly uh, extravagant kinds of praise. We have looked at a couple of the texts that are mentioned here. There's also others. He's mentioned in Daniel and elsewhere. There's not much that's left of him in terms of artifacts. He didn't apparently leave any statues of himself, but this is a statue that's found at the uh, Olympic Park in Sydney. I don't know how it got there, but that's the only thing I can find. Anyway, uh, he's the only non-Jew ever called a Messiah. You know that the word Messiah, Meshiah, the Hebrew, means anointed one. It was ordinarily a term used to describe people who were given special power from God through his spirit, through the Ruach Yahweh, as it's called, the spirit of the Lord, and they would, by virtue of that anointing, be able to do supernatural things. So the judges, for example, in the book of Judges, Samson or Jephthah, or Samuel, all of these people were said to have an anointing of the Lord and hence were called, in a sense, messiahs. So the Old Testament knows many people who were messiahs. But there was always an anticipation in the Old Testament that someone would eventually come who would be not a messiah, but the messiah. There was an anticipation that one would come who would more or less be the culminating messiah. And of course, we from a New Testament point of view, uh, immediately recognize that to be Jesus Christ, Christos, the Greek word for Messiah. Every time we say Jesus Christ, we're saying Jesus Messiah. And so we understand that he is the one who realizes all of those uh, sort of anticipations. But the Old Testament has many. 
The only non-Jew who's ever given that designation, however, is Cyrus. And the text that we looked at in Isaiah chapter 45 is the place where it's uh, given to him. So it's a remarkable thing, and it makes him unique then in terms of pagan rulers mentioned in the Old Testament. As you know, he authorized the return of the Jewish captives to Jerusalem. We'll look at this again in the chronology in just a moment, but just bullets about this guy that are important. He also created the largest empire to date in the history of the world. It actually exceeded the size of the Assyrian Empire by the time he was done. He also seems to have been the most humane ruler who would ever come along. Most of these imperial rulers tried to outdo each other in brutality and bloodshed and inhumanity and ghastly treatment of people who were conquered. Cyrus comes along like an enlightened spirit and thinks, you know, it's a lot better to be loved by your people than hated by your people. And so he, within certain limits, is willing to really do whatever it, he can to accommodate the reasonable circumstances of the people over whom he rules. And certainly the Jewish people were one of many that he treated in a remarkably humane fashion. And for that reason, some people have regarded Cyrus as, as maybe the most enlightened ruler to date in the history of the world because of the way that he uh, behaved himself in that regard. Kind of a quick chronology of his career. He did help Nabonidus retake Quran as advertised. And so at that point, uh, the, the uh, relationship turned out well. Then uh, Cyrus began a campaign going back into the region of Lydia. It's not quite clear what his designs were. He may have intended to actually press the attack that had been left off by his predecessor Cyaxares, or it may have just been he was out there to consolidate his control of that region. But it does give rise to one of the most interesting stories in ancient Near Eastern history. It's, it's not even mentioned in the Bible, but it's so much fun I have to mention it to you. And it has to do with this king who's ruling in Lydia, whose name is Croesus. Looks like Croesus, but it's actually pronounced Croesus. If you've ever heard of the wealth of Croesus, that old expression, how many of you have heard that expression? The wealth of Croesus, well this is, this is the guy. He ruled over the Lydians, he ruled in Sardis. Sardis had a river that ran by it with a lot of gold silt in it, and so that's how he got a lot of his wealth. He was concerned about Cyrus and decided, you know, I wonder if I should wait for this guy to attack me, or maybe I should attack him. But Croesus wasn't sure which way to go, and he thought, I'll check out some of the ancient oracles. And he did a whole series of tests and decided the only reliable oracle was the Oracle of Delphi, the most famous. So he sends lavish gifts to the Oracle of Delphi over in the Greek peninsula, asking the question, should I attack Cyrus or not? And the Oracle of Delphi gives that very famous response. Who knows? Does anybody happen to know that little bit of ancient trivia? The Oracle of Delphi responds to this request with the following. If you attack Cyrus a mighty empire will be destroyed. <laughs> the Oracle of Delphi was very smart, I'm going to tell you that. And that famously ambiguous response was, of course, misinterpreted by uh, Croesus, and he thought, cool, well, I'm going to go for it. So he musters his army, goes out, and sure enough, a mighty empire was destroyed. He didn't know it was going to be his own, you know, and so... Uh, as a result of that uh, battle, Croesus is conquered, but Cyrus, true to form, treats him very kindly, makes him one of his chief advisors. Rather than killing him, which would have been a standard fare, he actually puts him as one of his cabinet members and takes Croesus along with him for the rest of his career to give him counsel. That was kind of the style of Cyrus. But at that point then, basically, the Persians control all of what we would call Turkey right up to the, Mediter or to the uh, Aegean Sea. He doesn't try to cross over into Greece. He'll leave that for a successor to him, but nevertheless, he controls all of that. As it turns out, the Babylonian king Nabonidus had double-crossed Cyrus, joined the opposition, and so at that point, their treaties were off. And after a little bit of activity in the east, Cyrus launches his campaign on Babylon. And so in 539, he comes down 
Nabonidus, of course, escaped. Belshazzar, as we saw last week, saw the handwriting on the wall, was killed that very night. Babylon was taken without a shot being fired, and Cyrus, who was a brilliant engineer as well as warrior, takes Babylon. And that is the end of the Babylonian Empire, about halfway through the career of Cyrus. Cyrus gave the control of Babylon to somebody who is uh, known as Gabirus. If you were paying attention last week, you may, have re- you may recall at the very end of chapter 5, it indicates that it says Darius the Mede received the kingdom. You may recall that. Well, Babylon was actually conquered by Cyrus, and we know that Darius and Cyrus are not the same guy because Cyrus is mentioned separately by name in Daniel. And so Darius, whoever he is, is not Cyrus. There's been some question who he turned out, who, who he would have been, but historically, uh, Cyrus actually gave the kingdom to one of the commanders under his control, a Median, by the name of Gobrias. Darius was kind of a title as much as a name, and so I think the best theory is that Gobrias is the one we're speaking of here, but he actually has the name, kind of a throne name of Darius, and Cyrus gives the kingdom to him. Not the whole kingdom, but just Babylon, kind of the Babylonian region is delivered to Gobrias. I think that's the best uh, explanation of what's mentioned there. Cyrus, shortly after taking Babylon, meets with these Jew- this very large Jewish population there in Babylon. Remember that Jeremiah had said, settle down, build houses, grow gardens, get married, have kids, be happy. You remember that? That was Jeremiah. Pray for prosperity of the city, and in, your, in its prosperity you will prosper. Well, they did prosper. And so by the time that Cyrus comes in the year 539, the Jewish kind of subculture had become rather robust and important. Economically, religiously, and so on, they had more or less defined themselves as a recognized and somewhat respected subculture of the Babylonian world. Cyrus knew about them. He knew about these Jewish people, and he was very favorably disposed toward them and seems to have been impressed with their whole history and tradition. Josephus tells us that he met with the leaders of the, of the Jewish population there in Babylon, and they actually showed him the Hebrew scriptures, particularly Isaiah. Now, this is Josephus. Flavius Josephus is the most important Jewish historian in the world. He wrote in the first century, and he gives us this very elaborate, extended discussion of Jewish history going clear back to creation, you know. It's very detailed, gives us a whole lot of interesting information, is well worth reading, especially if if you have a lot of time on your hands. You know, it's pretty voluminous, but it's great stuff. So Josephus, who's generally regarded as a pretty reliable source based on sources that we don't know, but he reports it pretty much as commonly accepted fact, that when Cyrus saw his name, by name, saw himself mentioned there in Isaiah, and saw that Isaiah had actually predicted that Cyrus would authorize the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. That's all it took. And Cyrus did not want to be in a position of resisting what was manifestly uh, this great God who was reflecting his own interest there in the Jewish Hebrew scriptures. And so Cyrus agrees to do that, and that's exactly what appears to have happened. Now, whether that's what happened, in fact, we, have, we can only refer to Josephus, so that's where I have to leave it with you. But for some reason or other, Cyrus did, in fact, send these Jewish people home with a huge amount of support from him. This was not unprecedented because we know that that's the way Cyrus tended to treat peoples that were distributed throughout the Babylonian kingdom. This is called the Cyrus Cylinder. It's the most single most important artifact that's come down to us from the reign of Cyrus. And while it doesn't make specific reference to the Jewish people, it makes similar kinds of references to others. And so we know that what Cyrus did with the Jews was compatible, was consistent with what he did with other uh, people groups at the same time. And so at this point, we know that he's acting in a manner that is not inconsistent with what was otherwise apparently his strategy. So this is about as much as we have to go with on external history. The story of Daniel in the lion's den would take place right about now. Cyrus, we know, left Babylon. He delivered it to Gobrias and left Gobrias in charge, not simply of the city, but of the whole region that was called Babylon. 
And so he was, in a sense, a king serving at the pleasure of Cyrus. And if you know the story of Daniel in the lion's den, you know that there were some jealous or kind of envious uh, peers to Daniel who were trying to get him in trouble, and he winds up getting thrown in the lion's den and so on. I think you all know that story from Sunday school somewhere, don't you? And so God delivers him. This is also about the time of a very famous vision that Daniel has. It's called the vision of the 70 weeks. Daniel chapter 9, one of the most controversial and difficult texts in all the Bible, let alone in Daniel. And the basic uh, drift of the story is that Daniel knows that there were going to be 70 years of exile, and Daniel seems to have thought after that would be the great culminating moment of Jewish history, possibly the return of Messiah, or not the return, but the coming of Messiah, and the establishment of you know, a great kind of Jewish uh, uh, kingdom at that point. And so in the face of his expectations of 70 years, God gives him this message of 70 weeks. And the 70 weeks turn out to be 70 weeks of years. So if you're familiar with Daniel 9, you know that's quite a famous reference there. So roughly 500 years, the message is saying, must go by before Messiah actually comes. In very round numbers, that's about the way it worked out. So some 500 years later, we reach the time, roughly, of the birth of Messiah and the events that are alluded to there. However, the text in Daniel chapter 9 is extremely complicated, very difficult to sort out, and I'm not going to try to take time to deal with it this morning, but just be aware that there's a lot of controversy about its uh, specific details. But the general scheme seems to be certainly plain enough that there was going to be this extended period and then Messiah would come, and that takes place right about this time frame as well. All right, so Cyrus authorizes the return of the Jews to Jerusalem. The, the first exiles reach Jerusalem in about the year 536. They begin the construction project. This is called the Second Temple. The first temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. The second temple now, which was there in some form or other up until the time of Christ, until it was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, the second temple begins to be constructed at this point. However, by 535, there's considerable local resistance. So if you've read that story in the book of Ezra, you know that there were local folks who were resenting and trying to retard and impede this construction project. And unfortunately, what happened was Cyrus was off on another military campaign and left kind of the management of things at home to his son Cambyses. And as much as Cyrus was favorably disposed to the Jewish people, Cambyses, his son, was equally unfavorably disposed. And so he gave them no help. And in fact, the building of the temple stalled out. They got the foundation laid. They got up a couple of, you know, two by fours and so on. And then the project just stopped. So in 535, they've got a half-built temple. And they just leave it there as kind of an eyesore for the next 20 years or so. You may know, if you've read the book of uh, Haggai lately, that that's precisely the point that Haggai brings to their attention. You've built your own houses, but you've left this temple half-built, an eyesore. You need to get back to the business at hand. But Haggai is writing later under Darius. And so that's when the temple project is reinvigorated and completed. So it's some 20 to 30 years later that actually the temple is finished. It started under Cyrus, but not completed. All right, in 530, uh, Cyrus is involved in a fairly minor skirmish off in the east, and uh, he dies there in, a, in, a, in what wasn't really a great battle, but that was the end of uh, Cyrus, and he's succeeded by his son, Cambyses. We'll look at him very briefly two weeks from now, but we'll really be focusing on Darius, who is the guy that really picks up the story for us uh, in 522. The uh, tomb of Cyrus looks like this, fairly modest. You know, some of these guys built these huge kinds of uh, edifices to uh, celebrate their death, and Cyrus himself, of course, does something much uh, less impressive, but nevertheless, it's there to this day, so if you have to do any traveling through... Anybody ever happen to be to this site? I never have, but Iran is not exactly a tourist destination these days, so I'd be surprised if you've uh, made it by there. But anyway, there it is in a place called Pasargate. So uh, if you have a chance to visit, that's what it'll look like. Just a couple of words in uh, our Sunday school lesson, uh, part of the 
discussion this morning, going back to um, Cyrus being called an anointed one. I think you know that that term is rich in the Old Testament. As I was saying earlier, there are many people who are given this capacity of being messiahs or anointed ones, and invariably the central significance of that was they would be given supernatural power. Now, it might be power to do many different things. It might be the power to be a prophet and speak the word of God. So the prophets were sometimes called messiahs, anointed ones. It might be power to rule, as in a David or a Solomon, who were also said to have the spirit of the Lord upon them. It might be to be a judge or someone with, you know, like Samson, who has this kind of great physical power. But the point is, anointing always translated into a capacity to do something above and beyond normal, natural competence. There was a time in Numbers chapter 11 when Moses, who was really the only anointed one among his people, was feeling the weight and the burden of all these others who were clamoring, you know, for this and that and so on and complaining and whining, you you know the story and all of that. And at one point, God says, I'm going to take of the spirit that is upon you, Moses, and distribute it to 70. And that's the creation, really, originally of what came to be called the Sanhedrin. The creation of this body of people who were going to be anointed. Joshua was worried about that. He thinks Moses is going to lose credibility if God gives his spirit to others. But Moses says in this remarkable text in Numbers chapter 11, are you worried about me? I wish God would give his spirit to all his people. Moses said, I'd be happy if everybody were prophets. Not just 70, but 70,000, 70 million. I'd love it if everybody, you know, had God's spirit. Share the load equally. But of course, that prayer of Moses is not answered. But it becomes, in the book of Joel, a prediction. Joel chapter 2 says, Behold, the days are coming when I will pour out my spirit on all my people. You see. And that was part of the great new paradigm of the new covenant is that now all of God's people would have the anointing. And in some limited sense, I proceed very cautiously here, please hear it in the spirit intended, it was saying that there's going to be, God is going to make a lot of messiahs, you see. But it would only come when there was first this great messiah, the wonderful consummate messiah, the messiah. And so Jesus is baptized, and the Holy Spirit comes down in the form of a dove, and gives visible expression to the fact that this is the anointed one. And then Jesus, at the end of his career, says to his disciples, wait in Jerusalem for what? The promise of the Father, and you will receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That is, Spirit of the Lord baptizing you or anointing you type language. And so what Jesus promises now as part of the design of the new covenant is that we, all of us, as God's people, share in this remarkable, astonishing privilege of being anointed. In the Old Testament, it was just a few, the handful. Today, it's you and it's me and all of us. And Jesus said, you will receive power, meaning power to do something supernatural, above and beyond normal competence. You shall receive power to do what? What is the power we receive? To be? Say it. Witnesses. Not power to walk on water. Not power necessarily to raise the dead. Not power to do a whole lot of things. That's not what Jesus says. He says the power to be my witnesses. You have supernatural power to be a witness to the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes we think to ourselves, you know, I don't feel very powerful. Jesus didn't say you will feel power. He said you will have power. We wait around to feel it. We may never see it. What Jesus actually says to his disciples on one occasion is the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. You may or may not feel it. But the promise that God gives is that as you simply courageously open your mouth to say the most modest thing, expressing 
your confidence in Christ and the truth of the gospel, God may very well use that moment to unleash his power. And so my Sunday school lesson, my Sunday school exhortation to me as well as to any of you for whom the shoe may fit is open your mouth. We have power. We have the power to be what God has called us to be, namely a witness. And if you want to see power at work in your life, then just, just find the opportunity to say even the most modest word. I know some people seem like you know, they can just easily talk about the Lord in any setting. I'm not like that. I'm shy. I'm sheepish. You can tell that, can't you? My mother always, bless her heart, astonished me because I'm telling you she could be in a conversation with somebody for no more than 30 seconds and she was talking to him about the Lord as if they were her own best friend from all, you know, I, I, I was never, I ceased to be amazed, you know, at how she could do that. So not everybody's like that. Maybe you're like that, maybe you're not. But the fact of the matter is that as we just trust God to use those very modest things we might say, that he will unleash his power to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. So he used Cyrus in a remarkable way to accomplish his purposes in the Old Testament. I doubt that he's going to call any of us to be a Cyrus in the modern world, but he has called us all to be witnesses.